I'm Harold Cooper. I farm at Hill Farm Guestingthorpe in conjunction with my son Ashley. <coughs> I was born at Manor Farm Elmsett in 1918. My father had been farming there for, se for several years. The family had moved down from Cheshire to Elmsett in 1906. I went to a little private school at Hadley for a few, uh, at, Sud at Seema for a few years before moving on to Sudbury Grammar School. And I happened to be one of the last boarders at Sudbury Grammar School. There were 10 when I was there, and uh, I think they ceased when I left in 1932. I'm very proud to be wearing tonight, which you can see this Sudbury Grammar School old boys tie. And you do occasionally see one or two of these in Sudbury. I was brought up uh, in the farming life, <coughs> which was then in the absolute depths of the depression. Farms were then beginning to go derelict from 1929 onwards. I left school at the age of 14 because I don't think there were enough fees to keep me there any longer. Things were in a very, very depressed state. And my father had purchased another small farm at Oldham called Frog Hall and most of that went out of cultivation. Coming on to the war years, everyone had to register for national service in 1938 and I always wanted to fly so I joined up immediately and uh, one then could either join or, or they could volunteer, but there was conscription also. If you volunteered quick enough, you avoided the conscription. And I volunteered for the Air Force, and I was accepted. I had previously, in 1938, started flying lessons at Ipswich Airport, and in July 1939, I obtained my pilot's license. Going back to the flying again, during the years 1935, 6 and 7, I had tried to make an aeroplane myself and I had got this machine so that it would taxi along the ground, but my engine was not quite powerful enough for liftoff. So I was greatly rewarded when this government scheme started uh, in 1930, at the end of 1938 it was, and then I was able to learn to fly in 1930, summer of 1939. All the people after the conscription were in a category, all categorised as to what their occupation was. And as we at that date were farming and we were agricultural contractors, we, my call-up kept being referred back, pushed back six months, and then another six months, six months. We were the first people to use combine harvesters. We were the second farm in Suffolk to use a combine harvester. That was in 1936. We started then with crawler tractors in 1938. They were, that was a Lands Bulldog crawler. There were very few of these. They were made in Germany. And we were able then to mould rain and get uh, some land back into cultivation again because the wheat price had started to improve and there was a wheat production act and people could see that we were heading for war so food production then became more and more important and I, as I said just now, uh, it kept getting deferred and deferred as far as my call-up was concerned. My father <coughs> was a very far-sighted sort of fellow and he purchased two TD-14 crawler tractors which were on a boat going to Norway when Norway was invaded and these two, the ship rather, was brought into Ipswich docks and my father purchased both of these crawler tractors and throughout the summer or the remainder of 1940 because I think it was in May or June when these tractors arrived in Ipswich docks captured by the British as the Germans invaded Norway. 
we then started to expand this contracting business and I went out over into East Suffolk where I stayed with an uncle and my elder brother went over into West Suffolk and we were mould raining airfields and uh, helping the, the, the war effort all we could. We were walk, working almost day and night to get all the land ploughed which was derelict, all the farms which were out of cultivation. We were following the whole summer, we never stopped. We were ploughing every day from about mid-February right till harvest time, getting land ploughed for the following crops. In, during 1942, the end of 1941, I purchased, or my father, with my father's help, purchased Farrow's Farm, Belsham Otten. That was in Essex, about four miles from Sunbury. And I had to uh, start off on that farm, which was almost derelict. There had been an attempt to get a crop off it that summer, the summer of 19. 41 and I had one bulldog tractor and one man there on 250 acres and uh, you can imagine what a lot of hard work it was the hedges were at tremendous height the place hadn't been farmed for nearly 25 years so it was completely derelict when you went from one field to another it was like a rabbit going through a tunnel because the hedges and trees met right over so uh, most of the hedges were 20 30 feet high you it's very difficult today to imagine what the countryside was like in those days there were also hundreds of rabbits about all over the place well thousands of rabbits and of course all those had to be attended to before we could grow anything i purchased a combine harvester from stoke by nayland uh, this machine was pulled by a tractor and uh, it was an international 31RW, a very advanced machine for its day. And, uh, of course, that was the only one in this area at that date. Quite a few came in the next year, but I think I was the first one to use a combine harvester in this area. That was in 1940, for the harvest of 1942. Quite a lot of new ones came in 1943, and those were the Massey 21s. When... Uh, in 1945, I purchased Hill Farm Guesting Thought, mainly because I hadn't got a house to live in. The house on the foes had been derelict for 30 years nearly, and a lot of that is described in my son's book, The Long Furrow. Uh, perhaps it would be as well if I picked that book up now, would it? Because I just want to mention, can I stop there for a second? A lot of the early history of those years is recorded in my son's book, The Long Furrow, where he describes the <coughs> two, I think, of the contributors to that, describe the Foe's farm and the derelict state of agriculture during those years. In 1945, I moved up the hill farm Destinfield because there was no house at the Foe's. We had to live in a little house at Yeldon. And uh, this farm was for sale in 1945. We purchased this and we had a lot of uh, clearing up to do. This had been a dairy farm at that date with a milk round, but a lot of the land here was terribly sour and it hadn't had any chalk or lime and the crops were, you know, very, very poor indeed. We had a tremendous amount of work to do, liming, draining, and all that sort of thing. And it was during the summer of the following year that we were ploughing quite deep on a part of the farm when I was able to recognise fragments of tile which turned out to be Roman. Now, I wonder, shall we stop there now? Yeah. The Roman site to me has proved to be my main life's hobby. And I realised when I had a Roman site that I had to do something about it. I did try to get the authorities, the archaeological people, to come and do an excavation here. But it was in 1948, not long after the end of the war, and uh, of course there was a tremendous number of bomb sites to be cleared up 
and all the archaeologists were working mainly on the, on the, in the cities where they were going to rebuild on top. So I uh, started to excavate slowly and I became very enthusiastic. During the winter I took a flight to Rome and uh, studied all I could possibly study in Rome and uh, Pompeii and places like Herculaneum in Italy. The following, for the next 25 years or so, I had a fortnight's holiday somewhere in the Mediterranean area where I could study Roman remains, particularly in the south of France, in Libya, in Turkey, in uh, Italy itself, of course. Uh, and that was a great background for me. Uh, uh, <coughs> it was a great opportunity for me to delve into the background of the Roman civilization, which was coming to mean more and more to me as uh, I slowly uncovered this settlement, which covers about 10 acres. That uh, story is also described in this long furrow, uh, the first or second chapter, I think it is, and Ashley, has, my son, has, has made a very good job of that, but we are now in the process, or Ashley is, of writing a much fuller uh, account of the early excavations and continuing right through after the after we had to, we had to wait for the second and final uh, book or report on it because we had to wait for the official report which was printed in 1985 can i just show that sorry about that i hadn't got that one with me this final report I was very lucky during the early years of my archaeological work in meeting a gentleman called Jack Lindsay. And he was a very, very great scholar. In fact, he only died about a couple of months ago. He was one of the type of people who... He lived quite near at Castle Headingham. And he was a fellow who was always in the British Museum or at Cambridge or somewhere like that. And he was an author. He had written many books and I was absolutely thrilled when he dedicated this book to me. And this is called The Romans Were Here by Jack Lindsay. And in the front he's written to Harold Cooper with thanks for initiating me into the local archaeology, Jack Lindsay Castle Headingham. That probably gave me a tremendous boost. And after 30 years of excavating here, this is the uh, report published by the Ministry of the Environment and it contains all the finds that have been made in, at Gestingthorpe here. And you can see some of that anyway. But this is obtainable in the public libraries. Uh, it's called the East Anglian Archaeology, Volume 25. And that is in Sudbury, three or four copies in Sudbury Library, Bury, and all the local libraries. I was very lucky on several occasions with the archaeological work because I met some most interesting people. On one occasion, I had a Russian, Russian uh, professor <coughs> come and visit me, and he'd been excavating in Russia, and that was, uh, oh, about 20 years ago now, when the uh, liaison between the British people and Russia were not too not too calm and uh, I gave him a Roman coin which I'd found and he then gave me uh, a nice little book on archaeology but of course it was written in Russian so <laughs> I couldn't read a word of it but it's a very nice thing to have uh, now some of the highlights of my archaeological work uh, some of the finds went up a lot of them went to the British Museum of course and a tremendous tremendous amount of research has been done on them and one of the greatest finds was the evidence and part of a clay mould in which a statue had been cast and I was so lucky in meeting the great scholar Professor Shepard Freer from Oxford who did all the scientific work on this clay mould and he could show that a statue of Bacchus, the god of wine, had been made, manufactured here at Gestingthorpe. And 
he states in the final report, which is published in Britannica, and in the <coughs> which is it, which is the the main sort of archaeological bible, if you like, it's published every year, and he states in there that this is a unique find from England, and it is the only recorded place where these things were made, Gestingthorpe in Essex. Also, uh, I was thrilled to read in a book by Brown and Strong a description of bronze working in the world, and uh, early bronze working, and after uh, quite a, a page or two about Greece and the Middle East, they then mention that bronze casting was also carried on in the village of Gestingthorpe in North Essex. That meant a tremendous amount to me. Uh, now, I think I would like to show you one or two of the most important finds. Can we see? This is one of the complete Roman tiles which has come from the excavations. Uh, you see a very, very heavy, nicely baked clay tile, tapered from about 10 inches down slightly tapered the whole way so that the next tile would fit in this end and then they were covered by a ridge. It was these particular corners which first puzzled me, this recess here, because tiles have never been made like this in Britain. Although they were made on the continent, they were not made here. And of course it was finding small fragments of these that uh, first put me on the trail of this Roman work. <coughs> as well as finding pieces of tile, of course, I have uncovered several buildings. One very, very large building, which was 160 feet long, 20 feet wide. Uh, the walls were three feet thick, constructed of flint. And there had been two separate central heating systems in it. One to heat the dining room, which had an apse end, a 20 20-foot apse end, and uh, there was a separate bath block in the courtyard, which had been underfloor heated also. Uh, it was a very large building, and very substantially built by these flint walls, three feet thick. About a, a 30 yards from that, from, from the very big building, we excavated the ditch, which had run beside uh, a series of hutments or small houses in which carpenters had been working, cobblers, brick uh, pottery, uh, car, glass making, bronze working, and all the little things that you would expect to be going on in a village. And of course it was in a ditch where children ha had been playing about with things where I made a lot of my best finds. A lot of the best bronze jewellery was found in the ditch. And there were lots of ditches around the place because we must remember that this settlement was founded somewhere about 50 BC by Belgic tribes that had fled from Gaul as Caesar conquered Gaul. And they had been in occupation here for anything up to 100 years before the Romans arrived in 45 AD. The Romans quickly settled this part of England and things were peaceful for about 20 years. After the first sort of 20 years, the, the people of Norfolk rebelled under a queen called Berdicea and they swept down here and destroyed Colchester, burnt St Albans and destroyed everything that the Romans had started in this region, <coughs> particularly all of the farms and that sort of thing. The Roman general was up in Anglesey at the time, Suetonius Paulinus. He came marching back very quickly, put the rebellion down. But the outcome, in the way that it affected our little settlement, was this. The Romans were very, very ruthless and anybody that had taken part in the rebellion was put to the sword. Therefore, most of the able-bodied men, whichever side they were, if they went with Berdicea, then the Romans put them to the sword. If they hadn't, wouldn't join her, she put them to the sword. 
So we left in the year 62, in the summer of 62, with a little settlement of women and children only. And the Roman government's policy was to disband soldiers after 20 years of service and send them out into the little villages and into the settlements, send the retired soldiers out to see after the women and keep the children, keep the settlement going. And the outcome was that, of course, the Roman soldiers were all trained people. They were all craftsmen of one sort or another, carpenters, blacksmiths, builders. They were very well-educated people. And they fused their culture onto that uh, of the people that remained here. And from then on, we call them Romano-British, half Roman, half British. And the settlement then here remained peaceful and quiet for the next 250 years. And great progress was made. Most of the people, I think, could read and write. I have quite a lot of evidence of that. They had a proper monetary system. I've been able to recover from the site 600 coins, or just over 600 coins. A lot of glass was uh, <coughs> was work. Uh, glass windows were in the houses. We've referred once to the central heating. We're quite sure that the agricultural system was so vastly improved under the Roman rule. We have got samples of carbonized wheat, which from analysis shows that the berries were quite as good as any wheat that we grow today. The yield wouldn't have been the same naturally, but it shows that the, the type of wheat they were using was very, very good. And we are growing some this year. Uh, some Roman, the same exactly that was growing in Roman times on this farm, just a little tiny row, one row only. And we hope to be able to make a loaf of bread next summer from wheat exactly identical to the wheat which was growing in Roman times. Now, as well as uh, the things that I have described, we have found a mass of things like hairpins, 150, I think, hairpins, some of bone, some of bronze, some of br bone, bronze, silver, jet, and even a few of glass. A mass of pottery, half a dozen pots, complete, undamaged, unbroken, and uh, that tells us so much about what was going on and dating the buildings and so forth. Because the Romans brought some very nice pottery with them when they came and uh, imported quite a large amount of what is known as Samian ware from Gaul, from France, and a lot of that carries stamps, the name of the person who made it. And uh, the archaeologists are able to say exactly where this was made and can date that within a very few years. So all that's been a tremendous help. During 1985, the site was scheduled as an ancient monument. That means that uh, it is recognized as, as a, a valuable archaeological site. And I had a lot of help in publishing this report, the one you previously saw, uh, I was able to, a young lady came down here, a scholar, and we were able to catalogue and tabulate everything. Everything was then taken up to London, to the uh, Department of the Environment, Fortress House in Savile Row, where everything was drawn and every piece of iron had a little section taken from it for analysis and I was lucky in meeting the scientific people uh, who were doing all this work. Many of them visited the site and I, I'm correct in saying I think that this was the f one of the first sites to have all the ironwork analysed by new scientific processes which have only just been made available. Uh, there's two things which I have not been able to find on the site. One is the burial ground and the other is the water supply. I would dearly like to find where these supplies came from. The burial grounds were usually on roads leading in and out of the settlement. And from the existing known Roman roads in the area, it looks as though a Roman road should run straight up from Braintree straight 
through Gosfield to the corner known as Folly Corner, Gosfield, and that's the southern end of the road from Chelmsford leading north. Then at Rodbridge Corner again, there is the end of a Roman road pointing south, and Gestingthorpe is in the centre of those two points, but no trace of the road can be found anywhere along the line. It should pass through Borley, it should pass very close to Smeatham Hall, and then to the Roman settlement, and thence through Maplestead to Gosfield. Uh, I think one of the reasons may be that the road was picked up in medieval days by women and children when the churches were built in the 10th, 11th century. Uh, there are 13 churches along this route. I think there are, <coughs> well, there's Melford at the other end, of course, and then Liston, Borley, Bulmer, Belsham Walter, Gestingthorpe, Wickham St Paul's, Maplestead, there's two Maplesteads, and of course you've got Castle Headingham very near as well, which would have taken thousands of tons of stone. And I think this road was picked up by donkeys, uh, picked up by women and children using donkeys and pannier bags on the side of the donkeys. I think they would go and get a couple hundredweight of stones perhaps every every evening, perhaps during the summertime, and in that way our road has disappeared. It would have crossed the river somewhere near what we call Barford Bridge. And I remember Charlie Gardner telling me about 30 years ago that when his grandfather walked to school from Borley, when that bridge was built, that's going back a bit, the people building the bridge came upon a dugout canoe when they were digging the foundations for the bridge. And it was so hard, this oak dugout boat, that they left it there. They cut out a little bit on one side of it where they could get their bricks down, and it's still there. Maybe 12, 15 feet down in the bottom of the river. Now returning back to the site again, or the history of the site, uh, everything prospered until about the year 300 at Gestingthorpe, and then a degeneration slowly starts to set in. The, it can be noticed quite definitely in the coinage which goes from coins on which you could read every letter. After about 340 or 350 the coins began slowly to sort of disappear and we have a lot of squiggles. There are a few good coins but not many and the coins is debased, it goes smaller and smaller until by 420, 450 the coins have disappeared altogether and there's no... the last regular coin we have is about 395 and from then on the next 50 years sees the end of the Roman Empire the end of the Roman culture in this country. It may have carried on for a few more years but there's very very little evidence. It looks as though writing and reading disappeared it looks as though we were entering and obviously we were into the, what we call the Dark Ages and from then on we really know nothing. During the Roman period we have quite a bit of evidence of writing and reading here. We had eight iron stylus which I was able to recover from the main building and several iron stylus from even huts and houses where poorer people were living in because not all the people in this settlement were living in the bee house. A lot of people were living in smaller thatched and possibly wattle and door buildings one of the finds which I would just like to show you is this one. It's one of the tiles which was used in the central heating system. You see it's hollow for carrying the underfloor heating up the walls so that the walls would become warm in cold weather. And someone had scratched on this tile a fish which was a Christian symbol. I've outlined the the representation of the fish with chalk so that it can be clearly seen. You can see the tail on my right hand side here quite clearly. The tail of the fish and this is the head. And this was a very early Christian symbol. And just as a sideline, this is the tile that was featured on the television program from Sudbury.
from St. John's Church in Sudbury. This is an iron axe, a chopper, something people would have to have. You couldn't exist in the ancient world unless you could chop wood or cut. You had to have every homestead would have to have a, a chopper of some sort. And this is a plowshare, very similar to the plowshares we use today. And this one had been laid by a blacksmith. The farmer had worn this plowshare up and he then laid another piece of metal or the blacksmith had on top of it so that it would be what we would call reconditioned. You can clearly see the hole which had held this plowshare onto the plow. And oxen were, were used probably for draft as I don't think there were any horses used for draft at that date. We know the Romans were, were, were quite good farmers and good agriculturalists. Uh, we, they introduced us to the cherry. Uh, they brought that with them. They also introduced the pheasant. They did a lot of uh, drainage works. They understood the cl marling of land. That means putting clay or chalk, chalky clay onto light sandy land, which was short of calcium. And, uh, of course, they were great experts at vines and the production of grapes. The, it, oh, they also introduced the turnip and not the rabbit. The rabbit didn't come till later. I'm often asked about that. Now, the rabbit didn't come till the, the crusade at the time of the 11th, 12th century, 13th century. Right. This is my wife who has uh, helped me throughout my archaeological work. She's been very patient when I used to bring home lumps of dirty pottery and everything into the sink. And uh, uh, she has also enjoyed the benefits of uh, visiting many, many Roman sites in this country and uh, when we've been on holiday abroad. I, I think I said previously we've visited most of the Roman sites around the Mediterranean area. Quite right. <laughs> this is uh, a branch cut from a tree and this is the type of early Roman plough uh, which would have been used on the site. This type was used for anything up to 100 years before the Romans arrived. And of course, none, no wood or anything like that survives. But I have found the iron plowshares which fit onto the snap. <coughs> in the same way that the modern plowshares. I made this up really so that uh, when I was talking to school children, uh, it, they would uh, understand what I was talking about. This plough took me about five and twenty minutes to cut down in the hedge and bring home. Right now. This is a large Roman millstone. It's upside down. This is the grinding surface. And this would have been turned by a long pole or a donkey walking round and round. This is, you can see, a very good one. It's almost new. I don't think it's hardly ever been used. And, of course, they did use other smaller millstones, which they turned by hand. The wives would use those in the kitchens. That's all I can say. Onwards, we have a variety of the natural grass wheat, from which uh, the Emma wheat that we've just looked at was derived somewhere about 2,500 years ago in the Middle East. This type of, of grass wheat grows wild in Syria, Persia and the Near East. We haven't got a very good plant here, but we will not be able to tell really what we've got until it comes on here. Well, here we are at the Gestingthorpe Roman site. We're about a third of a mile up this uh, road from my house. And over here on the right hand, on the left hand side rather, were the main buildings. About 50 yards in here, we found the remains of the best mosaic floor. It had all been broken up in antiquity, but we could pick up many, many cubes off the surface. Down in the hollow stood the very largest building. That is the one which I described earlier, which was 120 feet by 60 and along on the edge of the slope there, on the far edge, on the 
going slightly up was the large ditch and beside that ditch were the carpenter's shops, blacksmith shops and the industrial bronze working and things of that nature as well as the cobblers and the leather workers. It was like the whole area was or developed into from pre-Roman times into a fairly largest village somewhere in the 300, 300 350s. And from then on, I think as I told you, it all started to decline. Over this region, we have recovered 400 coins off the surface and 250 in the excavations. And those range from 50 BC. We have four Belgic Iron Age coins and the rest are normal Roman coins, including almost all the emperors throughout that period. I think that's all I want to say about the Roman site at this point. We will now have a look round this side because this is the direction of what I believe to be the main Roman road through this region. It came up from Chelmsford straight through Braintree to a, a point called Folly Corner Gosfield where it just disappears, which is five miles south from here. Now, when we go north, we pass through part of Bulmer and Borley, and then on to Rodbridge Corner, where there is another Roman road known. There was a crossroads in Melford. So we presume that this road must have gone through here. Where it has gone to and why it can't be found, I cannot understand. But evidence may turn up in the years to come. When the huge gas pipe was put through here several years ago, it crossed that line several times. And I walked the whole length of this pipeline to see if there was any trace of that Roman road. But there just was no trace anywhere. It's one of the puzzles. But it would not do for everything to be plain sailing and easy Otherwise, there would be nothing or no interest in archaeology at all. It is only the puzzles which are presented and the difficulty sometimes of finding something which uh, makes it a most interesting hobby. Now, there's a, two or three people whom I would like to thank. I would like to say a, a word of thanks to the late Mr. M. R. Hull or his family because he was the curator of Colchester Castle Museum when I started this work and he was an enormous help to me. He was a very kindly helpful gentleman. Also I must thank the family of Major John Brinson and he was president of the Essex Archaeological Society for several years and he would come up and see me whenever he possibly could. He gave me much helpful and friendly advice and he would walk across this site with me and he would explain how things were, and it was from him I did learn a tremendous amount. He was also instrumental in introducing me to uh, many other archaeologists and people who were interested in research. It is always the beginning, I think, the first step on the ladder, which is by far the most important. Also, I must mention my father. Although my father didn't do any archaeological work, he was a, a great scholar, and he was very, very interested in history. Also, my grandfather and great-grandfather. My great-grandfather, I think, had almost a complete set of the classics. And we've still got some of those even today. In the very beginning, I started to learn all I could. And one day, there was a salesman coming around with the Encyclopedia Britannica. And uh, uh, that fired my imagination when I saw that there was a quite a lot about the Roman civilization in that. So I purchased that, and it's been a very, very handy uh, document to me ever since. I think that's all I want to say now. Just to... I would just like to recap again about the p report that was published, the East Anglian, Arche Arche East Anglian Archaeology Number 25, which most of the material in there is now 15 or 16 years old. And with uh, a lot of the recent finds, I'm looking forward to Ashley's publication 
in perhaps two to three years, three, four years time possibly, when he is going to write a much fuller report of the work that's been done here and the surrounding areas. He's very, very interested in archaeology and we have, there's quite a lot for him to write about, which has not been published, which throws new light altogether.